Okay. Um, as I said, uh, this talks about kickstarting SRE on cloud. And I guess the key idea that I want people to try and take away from this today is that SRE is based on kind of fundamental principles. And if you kind of step away from those, you kind of step away from SRE and it kind of all goes a bit weird and a bit different. And you kind of don't get what you're trying. You don't get the outcomes you're trying to achieve. Um, you can't just adopt practices from another company and go, hey, look, we're doing it because you're lacking the thinking and the understanding that goes underneath them. And when you're really, when you're doing SRE, you're trying to drive better business outcomes through reliability. That's really what you're doing. Like at the end of the day, like you're like, oh, we're doing SRE. If the business outcomes aren't being improved because your systems are more reliable, then doing SRE is a little bit pointless. Whatever you're doing isn't working. So when you're kind of thinking about this, your North Star is more around how my business outcomes improving. Is all this investment in higher skilled staff, which generally comes with SRE, is that actually driving the business in the right direction? Because if it's not, that's a lot of money to go into something that's not really working. And this is kind of just based on um, my experience working with a lot of enterprises that quote unquote do SRE. And yeah, they've got a team, it's called an SRE team, and they do a couple other things. And there's some practices that look approximately correct, but at the end of the day, they're not getting the outcomes that they're supposed to get. And kind of a little bit of the surprising thing, I think even I missed this when I kind of initially read the SRE book that Google released a lot, of, quite a long time ago now. It was 2014, eight years maybe. And like, if everything is managed under SRE, then you're not doing SRE. Like, it really at that point, it's just rebadged operations. SRE is a significant investment. It is a large amount of effort and time that you're putting into like uplifting these systems and making them hyper reliable in most cases. You don't have capacity to do this for every system, especially at an enterprise where there's you know hundreds upon hundreds of systems. You cannot do this for all of them. It doesn't work. If you are, if you're like doing SRE for every system, you're probably not doing SRE, you're just doing rebadged operations. And and the reality is that operation, you have SRE and you can have operations as well. You can have both of them. One is not a replacement for the other. They are complementary. Operations is for the systems that just need to be on. Um, and they, you know, they run business hours and, you know, them being hyper reliable in five nines doesn't make a difference to the business it operating at two nines or five nines no one really cares cool that's operations still a very valid thing to do you don't want to go down a full sre journey if you've got systems that are def that define the business like when you think about where sre came from and it was with google and they had the the site and site reliability engineering was keeping up google websites that's where it comes from it kind of is almost a throwaway word now because you use it for all manner of things. But that's where it came from. And, you know, for Google, having Google search never going down was a competitive advantage for the business. So it made a lot of sense for them to invest a lot of money in that because fundamentally reliability is the primary property of a system. If a system is not reliable, if it is down, everything else that systems does, system does is irrelevant. It has to be up for anyone to use it. Hence... Google had this idea that really they should treat reliability as the primary property of a system. First, it needs to be reliable, then it needs to be secure, and then it needs to actually do some things that are useful. But these first two bits kind of have to be there. Um, now, when you're looking at adopting SRE, you can start whenever, theoretically, if you've got the political capital, if you've got the motivation, if you've got the people that want to go down this journey, if you have a business need for it, you can start doing SRE whenever you want. But generally, I'm trying to make change happen anywhere. You're looking for a compelling moment or what I've called them, I've turned them a flashpoint here. 
Like, is there something that's happening or something that's just happened that will make adopting SRE easier? Now, this example is based on the idea of an enterprise going into the cloud. They're, they're properly taking their first real steps at public cloud, trying to build new cloud native apps and all that kind of stuff, which is a very powerful flashpoint for adopting SRE, because when you're going down these cloud native app development paths, your existing operations team probably doesn't want to touch them because they're new, they're different. The operation seems already very busy and now you're throwing like a serverless app at them and they're like, what is this? So then, then okay, well, SRE starts to make a bit of sense now. We've got an option here to try and do something a little bit different. And I will point out, I'm talking about cloud adoption from the point of building new applications in the cloud. If what, are you, if what you're doing is like a data center exit lift and shift, this ain't the same flashpoint. That's not really going to help. It's not the right time to adopt SRE is when you're trying to move like 200 virtual machines to the cloud. Definitely not the right time to do it then. But, you know, if you think back to where you work or where you're going to work in the future and things like that, and you're somewhere and you want to introduce SRE, having the right teams to come along the journey with you is so critical. If you try and introduce SRE to a bunch of teams that don't care and don't want it, you're going to go nowhere quickly. So the presentation today is going to talk through Beck's story. Now, Beck is named after my wife, but this whole role and this whole story is fictional, I will point that out. Um, but it's based on a lot of things I've seen around the place um, and loosely based on it, a few clients that I've worked at in the past. So she's the newly anointed SRE lead at Quokka Inc. You will notice there's lots of Australian animals in this presentation because I am in Australia and I can't help myself. And she's an enterprise ongoing, undergoing a digital transformation, which there's barely an enterprise on earth which isn't going through one of those right now. Fundamentally, they're trying to change the way that they look at technology instead of it being technology is something which enables the business. It's technology is something that drives the business. And what we're going to look at is how she picked the first system to enhance her SRE. How do you find that first system, that first cab off the rank, the first step on the journey? How do you, how do you pick the right one to go with? Um, how you mindfully collaborate with the delivery teams. So there are a bunch of um, gotchas, a bunch of risks, and a bunch of anti-patterns you can see when you try and introduce this stuff into delivery teams. You need to be quite careful about how you do it, and I'll talk through some of that as we go. Talk through how she leveraged the cloud to accelerate the journey. I'll say right now, you do not need to be in the cloud to do SRE. If you are in the cloud and you do it right, you will do you will be able to accelerate the journey into you into SRE quite quickly by making the best use of the cloud as you go, and that's kind of the part of the point of this talk. We talk about common challenges that can derail SRE adoption at an enterprise. I'm kind of looking at enterprise here because, to be honest, a lot of those common challenges, if you're a startup, don't really exist. But also, startups don't generally do SRE either because high reliability systems is actually not the most important thing for them because they're too busy iterating to find product market fit. So there's better use of the engineering resources. And last, we're going to have how to prioritize between systems when looking to drive the greatest impact. So when you've got that first system that's gone well, and then all of a sudden you've got a few teams coming to you going, we want to do SRE too. I'll talk through a few heuristics and ideas about how you can pick the best of the options. Because um, again, if you pick the wrong option, you can kind of derail your journey very, very quickly, even after some great success. So some key takeaways, um, which I think, I think of when it comes to SRE, net new development simplifies SRE adoption. If you're working with a team that is quite new, they're building a new product, it's generally easier to work with them on this initial journey as the first, first SRE one to try. 
as opposed to a system that's 10 years of history and everything else. Um, you want to move away from organizational scar tissue at first and then move back in towards it. So if you think on um, like crossing the chasm, like early adopters, early majority, you need to find your early adopters who are excited about SRE. It's not, you're not gonna get teams to do SRE by dictating to them. That's the way that things are gonna be done. You want to be inviting them to come on the journey with you because that's how you breed trust. That's how you make change. That's how you change culture. And like everything in tech nowadays, DevOps, SRE, everything, really it's a cultural thing it's a more than a technical thing it's always a cultural thing more than a technical thing you need to get people thinking the right way using the right principles that you know arriving at the right decisions that all happens from culture it doesn't happen because you're using a particular tool um so you build where the business is going not where they are today so as i said the story is about a enterprise going into the cloud so you're not going to invest a huge amount of effort in how to do S3 for on-premise if on-premise is not part of the plan for the future. You should just start building for the cloud. So when you're looking at these things and prioritizing, make sure you're building for the business is going to be in 6, 12, 18, 24 months, not where they are today, because you're just going to waste a lot of effort in building stuff that's going to end up being redundant. And use cloud-native tooling to accelerate. Um, when you're doing SRE, the tools that you've used in operations probably aren't going to really support you on that journey. A lot, a lot of the time when you're going into the cloud, you're doing cloud native and everything else, and you're using a uh, new relic or um, uh, you know, other tools in that space that were kind of born in a different era. A lot of the time, they're not going to come with you and enable you in the right way. And often, you know, there's licensing and all that kind of nonsense. And often if you're in the cloud, I'm going to use AWS as the example for a lot of this today, that there's normally a tool in AWS you can use, which is probably more what you want. And you just pay per use. You don't have to go down the whole licensing rabbit hole, hooking into existing systems to just where productivity goes to die. So, uh, Stolu did a very nice introduction for me, but just to kind of rehash, because I kind of have to, I'm Josh Armitage. I'm a distinguished technologist at Contino. Um, my LinkedIn was already put in the chat. Uh, you can find me on Twitter as well. Uh, I wrote a book with O'Reilly that came out earlier this year, HashiCorp Ambassador, APN address Ambassador. Uh, I work with enterprises. I've done a lot of serverless development. Um, I do a lot of speaking and I kind of make a nuisance of myself in many places. Um, I write lots of blogs and, you know, all those kind of things. So um, the seven principles of SRE. So these are taken from the original SRE book, then in the SRE workbook, and then they're in the SRE enterprise adoption guide from Google and all those kind of Google are very set on these being the principles. And seeing as they're the guys that came up with it is, you know, a very good place to start. As you mature on your SRE journey and you've been doing it for three to five years in the enterprise, you might decide you don't like one of these principles, you want to add more. Cool. When you've got the experience, go for it. But when you're coming into this kind of net new and everything else and you're trying to take this adoption, it's probably better to take the principles from people who've lived it, breathed it, right? And Google. The SRE function has been around for like 15 years, I think, by now. And, you know, there was the precursors to SRE. And, you know, there's lots of decisions that Google made that led to SRE being developed. And these are the principles that they still stand by as of today on it. Um, so well-worn, battle-hardened principles. And as we go through, you'll notice on the top right corner of a lot of the slides that I've noted the principle that we're using that's driving the decisions and driving the choices that are being made at the time as well to actually try and add a bit of flavor to them. So Quokka Inc., this enterprise is going through digital transformation. Uh, they have a few teams building cl new cloud native applications. It's still very early days for them. They've got a new digital storefront called Koality that is taking off and it's been built by the Wombat Squad. The existing operations function doesn't have the capability to support cloud native apps. They've, these development teams are very much running in the DevOps, you build, you run mode, which makes sense for what they're trying to do. 
but operations are kind of unwilling to come to the party here. Even if the team wants to try and share something on core responsibility or get some support, operations not in a position to do that. And they don't want to integrate into kind of the existing cumbersome monitoring solutions that, you know, uh, expect virtual machines to work and that kind of stuff because they're writing serverless. There are no virtual machines. So what they're looking for is a more modern approach to operating their systems in production. They want, they, what, what, what are people doing when they're doing cloud native stuff? Like what, what are they doing? What, what's the current good practice? I'm not going to say best practice because that's not true, but what's the current good practice? Where are we going? So Beck is the new SRE lead. So she's an existing employee because one of the things with SREs, you do not need to go and hire a bunch of SRE people. You can, but that's a stopgap. It's only part of the problem. If you're not training and upskilling your people and all that kind of stuff, you, your journey is going to fail. You can hire some, but you can't just hire a bunch of people and go, hey, we're doing SRE today. It doesn't work like that. Um, she's got the full authority to define what SRE means for Quokka Inc. Because SRE, uh, if we go right back to the original opening slide, um, your context is very specific in what SRE means to you. SRE at different companies, the practices will look different, and that is correct that they look different. So when you are going on an SRE journey, you want to have a strong level of autonomy in the team. You don't want some uh, leader or exec defining what SRE means if they're not the ones actually accountable for implementing it. So she hasn't worked as an SRE previously. So she's going on this journey. She's not coming with, you know, 10 years of experience or something like that. It's like, okay, where are you coming from if you're coming from zero? Because a lot of the time at, at enterprises, this is the situation. Maybe they've hired consultants in or whatever to help spike the journey, but really the accountability and the long-term drive should be living internal to the company. And often that's not an external hire. But she has done a significant research on SRE because she's not insane. Um, so she's read the books, watched a few talks, all that kind of stuff. So she's not, she may not have done it, but she gets a lot of the theory. And she also has a second member on the team as well uh, called Julie, because uh, if you're going to try and go down this by yourself, you're going to have a bad time. And fundamentally, this is, you know, you have to scale the team. The With SRE, the, one of the goals is to scale the team sublinearly to the amount of systems that you're doing. So when you double the amount of systems that SRE are helping with, you shouldn't need to double the team to get there. You should always be looking for um, how you can scale your impact without necessarily scaling the team. Obviously, you will need to scale the team at some point, but that should be the last resort, not the first, like, let's have a team of 12 SREs on day one. You do not need 12. You know, two to get started is probably enough, maybe three. Okay. So the state of play, so the quality uh, digital storefront that I talked about before, that the Wombat Squad is building, their users incre increasing 100% every month. So they're, they're scaling pretty, pretty quick. Um, they've only been going for a few months. Um, they're finding that bugs in production, you know, they, they're getting support tickets coming back to them, but it's slow to be resolved, like they keep all the, they're starting to have some issues in production as they move so quick. And the problem with all these issues is now they're impacting their ability to deliver features. Like they've got all these ideas and everything else, but they're getting stuck because all of a sudden they have all these bugs coming back. And the system's just becoming less reliable as they move really quickly. So Beck offers help from the SRE team. She makes it clear that the SRE team, they're not experts. This isn't like the hundredth time they've done something. They're learning too. They may make mistakes. Things might get worse before they get better. Fundamentally, the Wombat Squad has to accept the fact that there is risk to doing this. We all hope it's going to get better. We're all going to go in the right way. But potentially, in, you're going to introduce more change into the system, which is going to make it temporarily less stable than it was before. So, you know, embracing SRE is an experiment. Not every idea you have is going to pan out. It's not all going to work. And even if it does, it's partly good thinking and a lot of luck in there as well. You should be expecting failure. 
failure is the best place to learn. And, you know, for a team that's trying to push forward, they're having some issues, they've got two people who are going to come, we're going to come and help out. We're going to give you some extra woman power as, it, as, as the case may be on this one. Um, you know, naturally they accept. Why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you if, if you were struggling and people said, we're going to help focus on making systems more reliable and reliability is your main problem at the moment? Yeah, of course you're going to say yes, right? But one thing that's set in kind of the rules of engagement between the SRE squad and, uh, and the Wombat squad is it's for a limited time period. And that's set up front to three months. You don't want the Wombat squad to build this dependency on the SRE function. So if you go in with the idea that, hey, actually, we're just going to come and help you for a few months and then we're going to be gone, it stops the team getting overly comfortable with like, okay, well, they're still going to be around to help us in half a year's time. No, they're not. And they've told you that. And fundamentally, when you're going on this SRE journey, if you end up just being locked into a team until the end of time and you're, you can't escape, you're never going to scale that impact. You get away from that sublinear scaling. You get away from what you're actually trying to achieve, which is to increase reliability across many systems, not just one. So, Back as you'll get in there, go, okay, well, you've done post postmortems, right? When you've had bugs in production, like where, where are the reports? Can we read some of those? See what's going on? Uh, the Wombat Squad go, no, uh, we haven't had time. Have the time to do any of that. We're too busy trying to get stuff out the door. Uh, but now we run into a bit of a problem. Um, for Beck and Julie, they come in and they go, well, how are we supposed to know how best to help you if we don't have information on what kind of bugs you're having in production. We can't tell, you know, when we want to look at what we need to do and what the problems are and how they went and all that kind of, we don't have any other information. So, you know, they offer to facilitate the next few, next few postmortems, doing, taking the notes, getting everything down, bringing a template in. You know, they go to it last year and go grab one of the templates, standard. You don't have to divine something. You don't have to spend three hours looking for the perfect postmortem template. Just getting it down. And, you know, the the quality store has reliability issues. There are going to be plenty of postmortems. And, you know, they run a few, right? And when the next incident happens, the they realize that the issue was actually introduced and it was two days before anyone knew about it, before one of the users bothered to actually go to support and go, I've got a problem. And the squad was completely unaware until the user files a ticket. That sounds problematic, right? The, even though the fix was pretty quick to implement, and the user impact was still three days. It was still broken for three days, even though the fix went in in less than a day because they were waiting two days to figure it. They didn't know about it for two days. So one of the you know core principles of SRE is service level objectives, getting those measures in place. So Beck raised the idea of, hey, let's actually add some SLOs, right? Um, just helping identify when stuff is broken because the system's not that big, it's not that complex. They can generally fix stuff quickly, but what they can't, what they're struggling at the moment is more on the identification side of things. When you look at mean time to recovery or MTTR, you've got the mean time to identify plus the mean time to fix. The fix part is pretty quick. The identify part is pretty slow. So by improving the identification speed, you'll improve MTTR easier. Um, people probably aware of what SLOs are, but I always define them anyway. Um, so SLOs or service level objectives are promises about your system. You set up kind of a measure of how your system's going to perform. Before you get to an SLO, you need an SLI or a service level indicator, which is this binary definition of success or failure. So when you're, and I'll get into some examples in a second, but you need to define for a given transaction or a given request or a given thing, how do you define whether that was successful or failure? It needs to be binary. It needs to be obvious. It can't be something nuanced. You need to be able to actually calculate this with the system. So it can't be have any level of human judgment in there whatsoever. It needs to be black and white. Um, and, you know, when you're building a digital storefront, 
It's not like building an AWS service or something where you have SLAs that you send out to the business. These SLOs are like purely internal. You're not going to show them to your users using your storefront. You're just going to keep them internal and use them as a measure. And obviously, there is no real reason to add a service level agreement here because if the store is down, you're not, there's no kind of um, penalty to pay users back. You've lost their business. That's penalty enough. So there's will be no SLAs at any any point in here, and that's absolutely fine. Um, so when you look at SLOs, they always talk about um, applying to critical user journeys. Ideally, ideally, you want to be able to attach them to kind of the key things your storefront does. But um, it means you have to know what your critical user journeys are. Ideally, you don't want them to be that volatile, otherwise you're going to that kind of have to keep rebuilding the instrumentation. It's going to take a lot longer to implement as well when you're trying to get some nuance in here in terms of, oh, well, I need to, you know, follow them through this journey and track that they went through the entire journey fine, as opposed to just looking at something a little bit blunter, but something you can do very, very, very quickly. Um, it's better just focus on simple SLOs to start. Don't try and get these perfect SLOs in, in, in place right away. Let's just focus on something simple. We can get in in like, you know, half a day or something. It's not spend like three weeks implementing the SLOs and just watching the system fail over and over and over again without that measurement in place. And, you know, for an SRE team, it's a new SRE team. They haven't done this before. So let's just keep it simple. Keep it quick. So I'm just going to go through, you know, the example ones that they came, they came up with, right? So there's a website. You'd like websites to load quick. Uh, Amazon had quite a bit of research where they did on the slower the website loads, the the less people, less likely people are to buy, therefore loading websites quick increases sales. You know, th there's some research into that. So, you know, they want the homepage request to be served in less than 100 milliseconds. Um, so they measure that from CloudFront because they're using a content delivery network. It's not insane. Um, and the SLO ends up being 99% of homepage requests in the last month effectively are served in less than 100 milliseconds. Cool, awesome. Uh, added one for API availability as well. Um, so this is just taking a successful API request as a non five XX return code. So 200s, 300s, 400s, all fine. Um, and again, we've got 99% of API requests in the last month are successful. And also adding API latency as well. So saying that they're sufficiently fast. And this one's a little bit more complicated because it has the idea of uh, two different speeds of requests. So 90th percentile and 99th percentile of request speed as well. Now, if you work in the cloud and whatever, and you see five nines flying everywhere and everything all the time, um, I'm always one for when you're doing SLOs, you want to aim low, keep them low uh, as, as, as the engineers do yourselves a favor and argue for them to be as low as possible because it gets pretty damn scary once you get up to the high nines in terms of what that actually means you have to be able to do to get your system like that. I mean, you know, we taught most of those were 99th percentile ones. So in a month, you're allowed seven hours of downtime, roughly. If you go to five nines, you've got 26 seconds. The level of maturity to hit that is it's so much harder. It, you're talking like years of work really to get you there to consistently five nines that you are happy about or yeah like you know that's a lot of work to get there it can be worth it it's not always worth it it's kind of one of those things i was saying at, at the start going on this journey you want to drive better business outcomes through reliability and that's very different to making a system as reliable as possible because sometimes making a system more reliable isn't worth it so um, what you want to also be doing on top of this is looking at observability. So you know we talked about mean time to identification. We've got the SLOs in place. Hey, cool. Now you can see when the system's broken. You know, that, that mean time to identification should have been brought down from two days to 30 minutes. If you're going to kind of alert on error budget burn or you know, there's, there's options in there. So now the slow part is actually the fix, not the identify anymore when we're looking at recovery. 
And this is just classically cloud native stuff. Um, often people are very used to logging out of systems. When they go to serverless side of house, monitoring is a little bit different in terms of what you need to, or distributed systems in general. It doesn't necessarily have to be serverless here. And what you want is a high signal to noise ratio. So when, you, when you're building all this monitoring and observability, trying to understand what's going on in the system, every time you send an alarm, you should be very confident that that alarm needs a human to action it. And you're not just, you know, the classic ones are CPU is high on random virtual machine, therefore alert people. That is, that is not an SRE way of doing things. When you're doing these SLOs and you're trying to do that, you're measuring from the user's perspective, which is why the ones we went through were about homepage speed, API responses. The fact that you're failing at that edge means a user is being impacted by that failure. CPU can be high and no one can even know. It's very much of a tree falls down in the forest kind of problem. So when you're looking at SRE and systems measure from the user. You don't measure internals when it comes to alerting. So what you want to do, you want to alert on symptoms, not root causes. Um, so naturally, you know, we're talking server science. So although the devs, part of the Wombat squad, could be looking at this, if you're an SRE function coming and trying to help a team, you want to help build patterns and help them understand how they can make their systems more reliable through better monitoring and better observability. So naturally, you'd look at something like AWS Lambda Power Tools in the serverless app that's going to make it really easy to adopt. Uh, like it has direct CloudWatch integrations for logging, does CloudWatch metrics, and does X-Ray as well, and kind of gives you some nice speed ups there. Like, don't go and try and build some absolute cathedral of monitoring solution yourself try and find these low effort, low cost, low total cost of ownership ways of getting all that in. Um, you know, and then once they've got that kind of data coming out, then, you know, they can look at stuff like AWS DevOps crew to add AI ops to their stack. So rather than having to build all this monitoring, what can the cloud provider give you that will help speed that up? So in an AWS land, you've got DevOps crew that will use AI to try and tell you when the system's broken. It may work for you, it may not, but, you know, these kind of things are just quick, turn it on, see how it goes kind of experiments. So as an SRE function, it's better to do that than go, okay, well, actually, we're going to go and get this third-party tool and do all this nonsense because maybe the cloud provider tool is good enough for now. Um, and going back to the point where the SRE team has a time limit here, uh, they want high value, low touch. So these monitoring solutions should give you a lot of value and ideally they shouldn't require three people to keep it alive week to week to week you want the stuff that's kind of going to run itself as much as possible as opposed to building in these monitoring systems and everything else which all of a sudden you know require a team of their own to run um so they do share on call i think if you're doing sre you you know any kind of sre um of the different archetypes, which yeah, as Tola mentioned, I did talk before. I talk about it more there. It's not in the not in this pack, but you want to be sharing on call with the development team. You want to be learning at that call face. Um, you know, that's where experiences and patterns and all this kind of stuff is forged. If all of a sudden you're the one being woken up at 2 a.m. to fix something, you're very inspired once you've kind of recovered a little bit to make sure that that never wakes anyone up ever again. When you have skin in the game, you deepen trust. If all you're gonna do is come in like, you guys should uh, yeah, add X-ray tracers to your application because it'll be better, uh, but you're not actually gonna help them do it and you're not gonna kind of live the consequence of that decision with them, teams are gonna tell you to, uh, quite rudely tell you to go away, I would imagine. Um, it's a classic ivory tower, ivory tower architect problem where they come in from on high and they tell you how you should do things, but you, just, you actually want them to help or live with the consequences of the decisions, they have no interest whatsoever. Don't be that. And really, you know, you can go and read all the books, you can listen to talks, you can get certs. You need to take the theory, you need to hit, the rubber needs to hit the road, you need to take it into practice, and this is a wonderful way to do that. So, and this is where kind of eliminating toil comes in, in SRE. 
So yes, you do on call and you help with production issues, but this really should not be everything that you do. You need to set limits here. The, in the Google sense, the max toil and toil being kind of the fixing of systems that's done kind of manually and focusing on that, you shouldn't be spending more than half your time on that. Because again, you can't build the systems, you can't do all the other things which allow you to scale because you're too, fix, too busy firefighting. And if you have an SRE function, all they're doing is firefighting, it's not SRE. Um, so this is about maturing as an SRE function uh, to a large degree. So when you're working with a team, and this the three interaction modes comes from a book called Team Topologies, which I cannot recommend enough. So the way the Wombat Squad and the SRE Squad are working at the moment is they're collaborating, spending lots and lots of time together, very, very close, kind of becoming one team temporarily. Great for building understanding, great for building patterns and all that kind of stuff. It is the most expensive way for two teams to work together because it requires a lot of time from each team to make that work. And a common problem you can see is without this exit plan, without this timeline, without this kind of view to collaboration being temporary, teams get stuck in kind of local maxima where they're working together and they're, you know, everything's going really well. But if they're not kind of building a way to extricate themselves from the team, then something's got actually going really, really wrong. But it feels good at the time. It feels like you're moving forward together. The idea is you should be moving forward where the Wombat squad or the delivery team can move off by themselves. Like you, you need to allow teams to help themselves, but the SRT needs to focus on new things, on the next problem, on the next system. You know, classically, you know, writing documentation, making videos, creating workshops, doing all these things where you work with a team, you figure it out, and then you write, you run, it, create a workshop based on that experience. And now other people can go and do that workshop to get that same experience. And it doesn't require you to constantly be there for every team. So now that lesson gets embedded into lots of teams and you only kind of had to do it once and write up a workshop and then some level of support. But that, that's where you get that scale factor from. So when you're doing SRE, you should be looking at, well, the stuff I learned in the last month or the team I helped, how do I make it so the next time a team needs that help, I don't have to physically be there to do it. Um, naturally, when they're going through the Wombat Squad, and this is just a general maturing systems bit, there's this operational concerns. And doing release engineering, how do you make it so releasing code into production is not risky? It's always, always going to be some amount of risk. But how do you de-risk these? Um, so feature flagging is a classic one where you can separate deployment from release. So I can deploy code, but people users can't necessarily get to it straight away. And I can turn it on and off or toggle it for some people, not others, and all these kind of things. And these are patterns that, as an SRE function, you need to be able to help people adopt because it makes the systems more reliable. It gives you more options going forward in your architecture and with code. You're able to move code quicker. Um, you know, you can do things like blue-green or green-blue deployments and canaries. Again, like all these ways of de-risking code going into production. And a, a really big one is you want to be working with the teams to push small changes. You want to be having, you want to be helping the teams move to a point where they feel comfortable to push small changes into production all the time that kind of deploying multiple times a day thing, that's where you want to be if you're working as a re team. If you've got a team that only deploys once a month, um, you're not going to get good value out of SRE. Out of that, it needs, the, needs active change moving quick to really get the value. So if you're working with a team that aren't deploying that quickly, even if they're a scrum team that's deploying once a sprint, which is an anti-pattern I need to test, um, you're going to struggle as an SRE function to really help with a lot of that. Um, you know, the one of the adages is the release the release process is how bugs are introduced and how fixes are made into production systems. So having that kind of code release into production really smooth, really quick, 
um, with high levels of confidence is fundamental for SRE to actually work properly as well, because you need to be able to introduce changes to fix things. So the automation one is a kind of an interesting one as well. Um, your release pipeline should be automated. I 100% agree there. But when you're looking at, oh, well, you know, we had this issue and we're going to add some automation to kind of have the system self-heal or all these kind of things, fundamentally automating automating things around a complex system, which is what every IT system we build is, requires deep understanding. Um, for the payback, often, you know, like, oh, I'll just write a quick script to automate this. And then all of a sudden you've spent two weeks writing the script and it gets run like five times a year. You know, if you're going to get payback on this automation that you're building, it needs to be run lots and lots and lots of times. Well, more than likely. Um, and it's also more code for the team to support. So, like, don't stress about automating all the things straight away. Focus on the automating the things that are going to give you the best bang for buck. Like, really, like, oh, I'll automate this because it'll be quicker. Ask if you need to. Ask if you're going to get the payback. What What's the timeline for when you think you'll actually have saved time on this? Um, and, you know, if it's like 12 months, it's probably not worth automating. There's, a, there's a probably a million other things you can do that can be more valuable. And again, with automation, build to your requirements. So the SLOs we set out were like two nine, two nine applications. So you can have seven hours of downtime a month. If you remember when I said that before, there's plenty of room for humans in the loop there. You don't need to automate all these things up to the nth degree. There is an opportunity cost of building the automation because you're doing that, you're not doing something else. Like from the development team, if you're not, like you could be building a new feature instead of doing this automation. So you have to ask yourself, what's actually a better use of your time? Not just automating things for the sake of it, but what's actually the best use of time. And if you're in an application, the two nine sphere, you don't need to automate all the things. If you're up at four or five nights, you do have to automate all the things because if something breaks, you have a whole second to fix it at five nines a day. Like if anything breaks that day, you have 0.9 seconds to fix. That is not enough time for a human. You have to automate that. So, you know, when you look at this automation, it's a journey that you go through. Just don't, if you focus on it all at the start, you kind of won't do anything else. And it's not, it won't be worth it. Because if a system only needs to be two nines, don't try and make it three or four nines just because. That doesn't make sense. If the business doesn't see any value, don't add all this extra complexity around it just to try and get it there. And really, at the end of the day, you can always crank the mechanical Turk on this stuff. You can always write playbooks um, that allow you to kind of capture these things. If you've got something you think, oh, I think this could be valuable to automate, write a playbook for it to help the next person who comes along to do it. And then track how many times that playbox playbook's been followed and get feedback on it. And all of a sudden you have this playbook that people are, oh yeah, no, this is good. Like, yeah, we do this a lot of times, it helps. Okay, that's probably a good good opportunity to automate then because you've kind of proven you've got the like the business case, you've proven the value of automating this will save people time. And you can kind of point back to the data to do that. And you know, when you're in the cloud, a lot of time you can architect away from failures. You use load balancers and health checks to pivot away from unhealthy systems and you can do all these things and quite often you can rely on the cloud to do quite a bit of this stuff in terms of um, handling failures within a distributed system can't cover everything but really look at look at how teams are architecting in a way because our reliability is an outcome of architecture well it's an emergent property of architecture so as an sres you shouldn't be dictating architecture but you should be providing input and opinions in there. And last, uh, the last principle is simplicity. A, a simple system is more reliable than a complex system, because a simpler system is more reliable. Because it's easier to think about, it's easier to reason about. When you make a change, you've got a better, you, you'll have a better chance of understanding what it's actually going to do. Um, and one of the things you can do in the cloud to make things simpler is if there's an AWS service that can do the thing, use the AWS service to do the thing. Don't try and build your own. Don't try and roll your own until you know for sure that you have to. 
you should be dragged kicking and screaming to do that as opposed to just running forward and doing that. Um, when you're doing serverless, often people look at architect diagrams and go, oh, that's so complex. Well, no, it's not really. The complexity is there kind of either way. What you've done here is you've got a complex arrangement of simple objects versus a simple arrangement of complex objects. This is easier to reason about because you can take every component in isolation and think about it and kind of grow your mental model out to match. When it's an EC2 machine with like some Java process and other process on the machine, it gets very hard to think about what's going on. And really, when you're trying to build highly reliable systems, you want to minimize complexity you're accountable for. So when you can push complexity onto the cloud provider and the operations onto the cloud provider to do for you, and the cloud provider is providing that service at a sufficiently high number of nines, then yeah, cool, go for it, go for it, go for it. Really try and do that. Like for example, like, you know, you need to introduce a circuit breaker. Cool, there's a pattern for doing a circuit breaker with eight step functions. There are like patterns here that you can kind of just copy and paste. And there's an SRE when you've got a development team that focus on features, sometimes they don't think about the operational concerns until it's too late. So all their operational work ends up being quite reactive. As an SRE, you can go, well, no, let's be proactive about this. Let's put the circuit breaker in now before you realize you needed it and something's gone wrong. Same with feature flags. I talked about them before. You can do this AWS app config. There's a Lambda layer. There's all this kind of stuff to make it pretty easy. But you're, as an SRE, you're going to have to help the team adopt this stuff and then go through that you know, documentation, videos, workshops, all that stuff on the learnings that you've had, you've gone, okay, well, we've used that config for feature flags for a couple of months with this particular team. Let's capture what we learn and get that and distribute it back out to the rest of the business so they can learn as well. And your know, buffer request with Amazon SQS is just like a classic pattern thing. But, but, you know, as you, you know, adding queuing can make systems more reliable because it allows you to buffer, buffer requests and handle surges in load. So if you're looking at a system, you're like, well, what happens if all of a sudden you get 10 times as many users or a lot more requests and that kind of stuff? You go, well, actually, you no, know, we should put SQS in here now to buff that load. So sometimes uh, teams don't think that way because they're too busy, well, I just need to get this feature out the door. So as an SRE, sometimes your job is to come in and go, hey, look, can we think about this a little bit more? So that was kind of going through a whole bunch of stuff that the SRE team over three months, I think that's pretty... Pretty ambitious set of stuff to go over three months with the team. Um, but they kind of went through all the principles with the team. So now the, now the, co now the Wombat squad get an understanding of all the different principles of SRE. They've gone, they've gone, taken the principle out of their context and, and come out with a practice at the other side that the team now takes on. And really, you know, the team that was having all these reliability issues at the start, after doing all this, they're going to feel a lot more confident in operating their app. They're going to have traces, logs, and metrics to help them feel comfortable that stuff's working in production. They've got the SLOs there that lets them know that, you know, they've got some room to fail and room to experiment, but at least they'll know when things start to go wrong. And, you know, if you've done this well, the team should want to kind of stay hooked into the SRE function over the time. It should be a very kind of beneficial relationship on both sides. It's not just the SRE coming to them with ideas. They go, oh, well, we took this a little bit further while, while you weren't here. And this is what we learned. And now can you go help tell, let us tell the other teams here? If you set them on the right journey, they should be iterating and moving further down kind of to more reliable systems by themselves. And one thing, you know, I talked about as being a tier nine system at the start. As it grows, as it gets more important, as the business impact of it going down gets increased, the SLOs will naturally increase as well. So we'll move to three nines, four nines, maybe even five nines. But this is a journey. You don't set a system up to be five nines on day one because you're not going to architect a system that's five nines capable on day one. And if that's your goal, you're constantly going to be in this hot mess you can't get out of. Instead, start with something a little bit lower and you, know, you can... You can get there. Of course, you can get there, but it's not something you can just do overnight. So moving on, moving on from quality. So I talked right at the start about this whole prioritization between different systems. So given these three systems, so they finish off with quality and like, okay, cool. We're going to go to, we've got some capacity to help another team on the journey now. So you've got like a core transaction system, it's on premise, 
It's under active development because it's a core system. You've got an internal HR application running during business hours. They're looking at, the, they just migrated it to the cloud. It's running on a virtual machine. And the third one's like a stock, the stock allocation app, which is being containerized and moved to cloud. So between those three, like hopefully, if I've kind of done my job here, you'll agree with me that the third one makes the most sense for SRE. Um, the core transaction system, in fact, it's still living on premise and it isn't moving to the cloud. Undirected development is positive. Core is a positive. It's staying on premise when the business has made like a cloud first movement and they're, they're all in on cloud going forward. And it's just that the risk of moving the core transaction system at the moment is deemed too high. You do not want a piece of that system. It's going to be very hard to make change. It's going to be very hard to convince people to make change, get, get reliability stuff prioritized, make changes. There's incumbent monitoring, all that kind of stuff. It's going to be really, really, really painful. You're going to burn months and feel like you haven't really got anywhere. The reason to go for it would be if it's having massive reliability issues and people are screaming out for help. But even then, it can still be treacherous. The internal HR application running during business hours and applying SRE for something like this is over-engineering to the nth degree. It only runs during business hours, so kind of not an SRE thing. SRE are more for 24-7 systems. It's an internal HR application. It kind of needs to be working or not working. Taking it from two nines to three nines, probably not going to make a measurable difference to the business as a whole. Stock allocation app being containerized, so there's some um, already... It's been realized for investment and being moved to cloud and all that kind of stuff. They're going through a lot of change, going through containers. They're going to be running in like ECS, EKS, something like that. All right. There's, you know, something there. It's a good good time to maybe try and align with them and make some, make some positive change in there. They're obviously very open to change. You have to be worried that not trying to introduce too much change, but they should be aware as they go get containerized and everything else, the way they kind of monitor the system is going to change drastically anyway. So it's probably a good time to come in with, here's some opinions about how you could do that and go on that journey with you. Now, comparing it to, you know, a, a, the theory of how it would go versus quality would be, it's going to be politically more challenging. It's an existing system with people with a lot of ideas. Um, you know, the system worked just fine. Why would we change things? Well, because the system probably didn't work just fine or it needs to be better. Or there's a reason here that the existing way of doing things just isn't working well enough anymore. Obviously, it would have much higher SLOs to begin with. It's very unlikely to only be a 2.9 system. It's probably going to be a 4.9 or 3.5 or something like that. So when they go, we're going to work with you temporarily, that temporarily is a lot longer. If you're going to try and take a team on a journey up to like three and a half times and getting there and all the cultural stuff and everything you need to get there, that's a, that's a lot of work. Google say for their systems, bearing in mind their systems go to like five nines as kind of a minimum. The when uh, existing application goes on the SRE journey, the timeline is three to five years. Now, depending on what you're doing, it doesn't always have to be three to five years, but that's. That's the timeline they talk about, and they are the most experienced SRE company in the world. So I wouldn't commit SRE capable, I wouldn't commit SRE resources for three years up front. <laughs> no way. I'd commit it for three to six months with a review of okay, do we think we're still making progress? What are we doing? All that kind of stuff. Just make sure that um, you have these kind of circling back to make sure that what you're doing is right. And generally, these kind of systems versus a three-month-old system, it's going to be paid out of technical debt, um, which is going to act as a significant blockage of progress. Generally, a lot of systems, the testing isn't good enough, or the testing is manual, and all that kind of stuff, and now moving fast is hard. And what, where you end up is with this J-curve of transformation, as it's known, which is like a classic thing in uh, all kinds of transformation, not, not just technology. Um, like you'll start with the team, you'll hit some quick wins. Uh, you'll help like kind of go, yeah, cool. We're moving better, we're moving better, we're going better. And then you hit this kind of brick wall of technical debt where the process 
that this team has been using to develop the application has led to certain like emergent properties. One of the classic here is manual testing. Manual testing of a system is if, or manual aggression testing of a system is nonsensical blocking and actually just break, it can break the back of a journey of a, a rev, evolution or revolution is going on the system. If you can't fix that problem, you end up in a, in a giant hole. And it's kind of on this bit here. So only with like a focus and you may end up working on something for a while before you see the benefits. Sometimes you plug away at tech debt and plug away at tech debt and it doesn't feel like it's getting any better. But you kind of just have to get people committed to the cause, believing in the cause and go, you know what, it's going to take three to six months. So let's measure what we can in the meantime, but let's not get disheartened at six weeks and feel like things aren't really improving because we know it's going to take longer than that. And that can be hard for some people, especially engineers that are used to quick feedback loops on things. Like you release a new feature to production, you do the dev, you write some tests, everything else. Like quite often your feedback is in the order of seconds to minutes to hours at the slowest. Trying to get the team aligned around something that's going to take weeks to months to have payback can be pretty difficult. But by being upfront about it and moving from there, you end up in a kind of better spot. So just to kind of come full circle back to the key takeaways. So net new development simplifies SRE adoption. It is easier to work with a team that doesn't have well instantiated opinions and technical debt and all this wonderful stuff to stand in the way. Alas, we do not always get to play with systems that are generally greenfield. We do have to deal with brownfield systems as well. I would just strongly recommend you try and go greenfield first. Make it easier for yourself, establish patterns, then go tackle brownfield once you've got more understanding, more experience and everything else. Don't go after the big behemoth system at the core of the business on day one as a fresh fresh SRE. It, it will not work. Um, yeah, focus on where the business is going, not where they are today. So yeah, when if they're building into the cloud, look at building SRE for the cloud. Don't look at building SRE for on-premise. Same as if they're going, you know, going heavily into containers, heavily into serverless, what, what, whatever it is. If you know, if they're going all containers, apart from two applications that are serverless, just build SRE for containers. Don't worry about the serverless stuff. Focus on where you're going to get when you're establishing all these patterns and everything else. Look at how many teams could adopt that pattern. It's a pretty good heuristic for how valuable that pattern would be. And use cloud native tooling to accelerate your journey. So. Um, Make use of what's there in the cloud. Generally, when you're on these journeys, don't feel like you have to use the existing system just because it exists. Um, you want to build something, again, that's built for the new reality where the business is going, not because, oh, well, the business pays this much in licensing for this tool. If it isn't going to work for you, be please be empowered to challenge that and fight that fight and try and drive it in the right direction. Um, we'll just finish off just coming all the way back around right to the uh, the same slide that was at the start of the deck. Like, start with the principles of SRE. Know those principles. You don't necessarily have to rattle them off. I, I can't unless I'm reading a slide. Make sure that you ingrain those principles into the way the SRE team functions. Because by doing that, you end up making better decisions and you'll end up with practices that actually drive better business outcomes not just doing SRE for SRE's sake, same as you shouldn't do Agile for Agile's sake or DevOps for DevOps sake or any of all, all these kind of things. At the end of the day, all these things are all about driving better business outcomes. And if you can't tie what you're doing back to the business outcomes you're trying to drive, then you're always going to be in a world of pain. So make sure you have the principles embedded and work up from there. Don't just adopt practices just because you see someone else doing it because you won't have the right understanding to make them work and they may just not be the right fit for where you're working. Practices are highly contextual. Principles are supposed to not be. Cool, that's all I had.